All right, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Dan, my co-author, for all his work on this, too. Uh, so I wanted to tell you about this tool by telling you my favorite episode of Star Trek. So here we have Captain Picard. And this is the one where Captain Picard is creating the replicator. So he writes some code for the replicator. He adds a module for T, a header file, C file here. And now it's time to compile this code. So he brings up his trusty terminal, types in his compile command. And he's got a program, and it works just fine. So like any piece of software, this is going to grow over time. Uh, so we started with just T. We're going to add support for temperature. So we add a temperature module as well. Update the replicator to use that module. And it's time to compile again. So type in that command. We've got a program. We can run it. It works. So this is fine. But what if somebody else needs to build this software? They don't know that command. They might not remember it. You might get complicated. Uh, and so what we really need is a build system. Now, I don't think it's going to surprise any of you to learn that make is still used in the 24th century. Uh, and so Picard writes this make file here. Uh, so we've got some wildcards, but it's pretty much the same thing he was doing before, but it's written down now. And now, when it's time to build files, or build this program, uh, we just run make instead. So we'll add a couple more modules here. So coffee, we run make. It runs our compilation command. We add cake, run make. It runs the compilation command. And we can keep on going and compiling. Uh, but this has a problem. Because every single time we added one of these files, all we had was this step to run. And so every build was a full build. And that means that as we get a larger and larger program, our build time is going to increase. And that's going to get old if all you're doing is changing one or two files here and there. OK, so we want a better make file that lets us do a better job on this build. And so we switch to this complicated one that breaks out separate targets so we can do a nice incremental compilation. So let's go make some changes and see what that looks like. So if we edit replicator.c, we run make, and it's just going to compile that source file and link everything together, just what we wanted. Um, so we'll make another change here to temperature. Uh, so we've edited this file, but unfortunately, we've got a linker error this time. And the reason we have a linker error uh, is that there was a bug in our make file. Uh, we missed a dependency. So this is really easy to do with make files. Um, and it, it tells us about two sort of important properties of make files or of any build system that we want to have. All right, so build systems need to be correct. And by correct, what I mean is that they don't miss dependencies, because they're going to do the wrong thing if you do. Uh, and your incremental builds are going to be consistent with what a full build would have done. You don't want those to be different from each other. That's how you get bugs. Uh, but we also want them to be fast. Um, so they should do as little work as possible, but not less than that. Uh, and these two things are in tension with make files. Uh, so I'm here to tell you today that there is a better way to do this. Uh, and that better way is Riker. So, so with Riker, what you can do is take your complicated make file and throw it away uh, and write this build specification. This is a Riker file. It's the exact same command that Picard was typing into his terminal to build the tool in the first place. Um, but from this simple build specification, uh, Riker can automatically run a fast incremental build. And it's correct because it doesn't miss dependencies. OK, so we, we've seen that there are some problems with make. Uh, so that's covered. Um, I'm going to show you next what it looks like to actually use Riker. Um, we'll talk about how Riker works once we've seen that. Uh, and I'll show you some of our evaluation from the paper. OK. So first up, how do we use Riker? So if we go back to Picard's example, um, he's going to use this simple Riker file. And we'll bring up the terminal and make some changes. So um, sorry, we haven't changed anything yet. We're running a full build. So when I run this first Riker build, um, what Riker does is it executes the Riker file. And we saw in that Riker file there was this GCC command. And so we're going to run that. This all looks very familiar. But that's not actually the end of the process. Because GCC is a compiler driver, and it will kick off the C compiler to generate some assembly, the assembler to turn that into a .o file, and do that for the next source file and the next source file, and so on. And eventually, it's going to link these all together into the final program. And Riker sees all of these executions during that build. Now if we go in and edit a file, like this temperature module that caused the problem before, we run Riker again. It's not going to run the whole build. It's just going to compile the source files that use this header file, so replicator.c and temp.c. And since those changed .o files, it's going to link the whole program together. So we're getting nice incremental build performance out of this. 
but how does Riker get from that simple specification to a nice incremental build that you didn't have to write down? So that's what we'll talk about next, how Riker works. So just at a high level, stepping back from the details, um, there's sort of three important pieces of how Riker works. So the first is that it's going to run your build script, the specification that you write. Uh, and that Riker file I showed you was a script. Uh, it can actually be anything executable. You could write a C program that builds your, your program if you feel like suffering. Um, but while it runs that, Riker will watch this execution uh, and observe all of the system calls that are issued during the build. And Riker takes those system calls and generates a representation of them in a language we created called traceIR. And this encodes important information about how the build worked, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And Riker evaluates that trace IR to update the build, and as part of that evaluation process, some of the commands in the build go back and re-execute, where they are traced and turned into trace IR again and again. Okay, so let's look at the system call tracing. So the build is running along, and Riker will capture an exec system call, for example. Um, we do this using ptrace to make sure we catch everything, but we use seccomp BPF to make it a little faster and an injected library to make it quite a bit faster, um, but we don't miss system calls. So when we have an exec, Riker denotes this as a command, and so the first command in our build is this Riker file, which I'll show you as this little circle at the top here. And the Riker file launches GCC, and we denote the launch with this dotted arrow connecting the Riker file to GCC. And GCC kicks off the first C compiler. Uh, so this is where things get interesting. So the C compiler is going to open and read uh, a source file. And so we intercept an open system call. Uh, that's a reference to a file. Uh, and so now we keep track of that file as an input to the, the C compiler. Um, and later we create a file by opening it and writing to it. So this proceeds again with the assembler. So the assembler is going to read that temporary assembly file and write out to a .o file. And if we let this build complete, many system calls later, uh, what we end up with is a graph that looks a little bit like this. So I've left a lot of things off because real builds are quite a bit more complicated, but these are the big pieces that matter. Um, and you can think of this as a build dependence graph, and this is something that people have used uh, in build systems before. It's a lot like what you're writing down when you write an incremental make file, but these have some important problems. Uh, so the first one is that intermediate state is really important. Uh, so this temp.s file is the output from all of the C compilers and the input to all of the assembler invocations, uh, and GCC actually does this. And it's really important that we know which state that file was in when each command ran. So that first AS shouldn't be seeing the output from the third C compiler. Um, and the graph doesn't capture any of that ordering information for us. The next is that there are cycles. Um, so GCC builds, even a hello world build, uh, will launch a program called collect2 that runs the linker, and it consumes the output from the linker to decide whether it needs to run the linker again. And we have this feedback loop, and if we don't know something about the order of those checks, we might find ourselves executing things indefinitely. And so we have to know something about the sequencing there. And then the last problem is one that doesn't appear on the graph at all, which is anti-dependencies. So a command can depend on a file not existing just as much as it can depend on the content of that file. And that's an important stage in any build, and we'll see an example of where that matters later. All right, so traceIR, the language that we created for Riker, solves all of these problems. So what is traceIR? Well, we'll go back to uh, our example in a little bit, uh, but traceIR is a language, as I mentioned before, uh, and it doesn't have any loops or branches, but we can still execute it. What it records uh, is really two broad categories of things. So traceIR keeps track of the observed system state during the build. So that means file metadata, content, directory entries, pipe contents, exit codes from commands, and much more. It also uh, records updates to system state. So if a command changes a file's metadata, writes to its content, um, updates the contents of a directory by deleting or adding something, uh, and more, all of those are recorded in traceIR. So if we jump back to our example build, um, we're running this program. Uh, we intercept a system call. So in this case, we saw an exec of bin GCC. Um, and the trace IR that comes out of this, uh, that Riker generates from that system call, uh, has a few steps. So the first is that it says, oh, okay, there's a reference to the bin GCC path. And that file doesn't exist, and so Riker will actually record that there was no file there, and we expect there not to be a file there. If there was, that would be a change. And 
uh, the shell is going to continue searching through your path environment variable, and so the next thing it will do is try to exec user bin GCC. And so there's another reference to a path, and this time this one exists, so we record that that is a successful reference. Uh, once it finds that file, it actually launches a command, so traceIR records the launch of that command in its output, uh, and then the build can proceed. So if we jump ahead a little ways, um, we can look at where one of our C compiler steps actually opens a file. So the C compiler will open source 1.c in read-only mode. Uh, it expects that to be successful, because that's what we observe during the build. And presumably it's going to read from this file, so there's a read system call. Uh, and Riker records that in traceIR as a match content predicate. So this is saying, we expect that file to have content with this hash. So I've abbreviated the hash there. Uh, there are also writes. So sometimes we open a file for writing and we might create and truncate the file. So that's a path ref as well to this temporary assembly file. Uh, and it's been annotated as read write, but also that it will create the file if it doesn't exist or truncate it if it did. And we expect that to succeed because most of the time this is going to work out. That's what we'll observe when we run our build. And once it's been opened, when the command writes to the file, a write creates a dependency on the old content of the file. In this case, it was empty and an update to the new content with a new hash. And you can see here that that file is actually being cached by Riker. That's important later, too. So last example of this that I'd like to show you uh, is for command interactions. So when our assembler is finished, it's going to exit. We'll say it exits with exit code zero. Um, so traceIR has an exit statement in its language as well. Uh, and the parent, GCC in this case, is waiting for that command to exit. Uh, and it expresses that with a join. Uh, but it also sets an expectation about the exit code of that child process. And so if that were ever to change, we would want to know about it, and so traceIR records that information. Okay, so we run through this whole process. We generate a bunch of traceIR for a full build. How can we actually use that to run the next build? Um, that's where the build algorithm comes in. So as I said, traceIR is a language. Um, so what we're going to do with our language is actually run it. Uh, we have a program in our language. We'll run it. So the predicates that are in trace IR, like expect result, match content, match metadata, those all detect changes that are observed during the build. And then the state updates, like update content, update metadata, exit, those all describe the effects of a command running. So if we jump back to our flawed but easier to look at graph representation, uh, I'd like to actually run through what some changes will do to an incremental build. So let's say for the sake of example that we've changed source 2.c here. Um, so as I said, we're gonna evaluate the full trace IR program that we collected from that first build. And when we do that, we'll at some point reach these path refs to source 2.c, there's an expectation that that succeeds, and there's a match content predicate. Uh, and this is going to be an observed change. So we know CC1 will see that, and that's important. So now we know that CC1 will observe a change, so we probably need to run that program. Um, you might think that we could say temp.s is going to change because we're running the program that produced it, uh, but actually we don't know anything about what CC1 is going to do. We all only know what it did the last time we ran it. We make no assumptions about what it will do the next time, and so we're gonna hold off on deciding whether or not this file has changed until we've actually seen what CC1 does. So we're not gonna propagate our way down this graph. So we've decided that CC1 needs to run. It sees a change. Um, but we can't actually run CC1 all by itself. Um, it could depend on output from other commands that needs to be in place. Maybe it's only there during the build and it's cleaned up afterward. Or, as we see in this case, it needs to put its output in temp.s before the second AS accesses it, not the first or the third. Uh, so that's an important step that we have to keep track of. So we need to set up for a command to execute by putting all of its inputs in place. And then once we've executed it, we need to run the rest of the build after that to understand how those changes in output affect the build. Uh, and we already have a way to do that. That's, that's what trace IR is for. Uh, so actually, our second iteration of this build, we're going to evaluate the entire trace IR program for the full build with the exception of CC1, which we will instead execute. And we'll trace that execution, and we're going to insert that new trace IR into the, the program that describes the full build. So when that's done, um, as predicted, temp.s is now changed. Uh, 
And because we evaluated the trace IR after CC1 ran, we had a predicate that didn't check out, and we know that AS, the second one, has observed the change because of CC1's output. And so um, it's important, because we kept track of the order of these interactions in the trace IR program, that we know it was only the second AS that saw that change. The others were unchanged. So we're gonna run the full trace IR program again, but this time we'll be executing AS. And the .o file changes, and so we know we need to run LD. And so we're going to run the full trace IR program, but we will be executing LD in this case. Uh, and this is where caching is important. So Riker has cached these outputs that were generated by commands that executed, and so it can stage them in at the time when those commands would have been executing, even though Riker didn't actually run them. Uh, and that allows LD to proceed and update the program. So now we've made it all the way through the full build trace IR execution, and we didn't detect any new changes, so that means the build is complete. So to just step back and summarize that at a high level, the Riker build algorithm is to always run the full build, full build using recorded trace IR for commands that haven't observed changes, uh, and directly ex executing the commands that do observe those changes, and you just keep doing this until you get all the way through it without finding any new changes. I will note that there are some situations where we run additional commands, uh, but you'll have to see the paper or ask a question to find out about those. Okay, so how, how well does Riker work? So we want to know some important things about Riker's performance, um, but there are different situations that matter here. So first up is full builds. These aren't the common case, but it's the first build you're going to run. It's probably going to be the one that takes the longest. So how well does Riker do on those? Uh, we also care about no-op builds. So these are builds where nothing actually needs to run to update the build. How quickly can Riker decide that nothing needs to run? I do these a lot myself. I'd like that to not take forever. Uh, and then the third one, which I'm gonna focus most of my time on here, uh, is incremental builds. So you've made some small set of changes. How well can Riker do at up updating that build, uh, doing the minimum amount of work possible? So if we take a look at our results for full builds, um, we have these 14 programs which we built using Riker, uh, and what we're doing is running the entire build with Riker's tracing, trace IR generation, all of the various change detection and potential iteration happening in that build. Uh, and you can see that the overhead is generally low, but there are a few outliers here. Uh, so the median overhead is 8.8%, um, and the median additional build time, which is on a different set of benchmarks, is just 1.2 seconds. And that's actually because larger builds have lower overhead with Riker. Um, Case in point, we have these two outliers here. Autoconf and core utils are kind of the worst case for Riker. It does a lot of tiny compilations, and so there's lots of tracing overhead, setting up tracing for new processes, and not a whole lot of work that happens between those tracing events. The five longest builds that run are some of the lowest overhead. So the largest of those is protobuf. Uh, in terms of overhead, that's about 8%, and the longest running build is LLVM, and that only has 4% overhead with Riker's tracing and modeling and all of that. So we would say this full build overhead is generally acceptable, especially for these large projects where I think Riker is most likely to be valuable. Next up, we have no op builds. So remember, this is the time it takes to run an incremental build that doesn't have to do any actual work. So the median delay, if you're using Riker compared to make on all of those projects, is just 162 milliseconds. And the worst case, the longest wait that we have is LLVM. Uh, so LLVM takes 11.3 seconds for Riker to decide, nope, you didn't change anything, nothing has to happen, whereas Make takes 4.8 seconds, which is quite a bit longer than Make does for much smaller projects. But there's no tracing happening here, so why does Riker actually take longer than Make? Uh, so it's not just wasting time in the holodeck. Riker is actually doing more work than Make is. So Riker checks all of the build's dependencies. That includes those anti-dependencies, dependencies on the compiler binaries, system includes, libraries, configuration scripts. All of that is part of the dependency graph. But make is only gonna check the dependencies that you tell it about. And I have never written a make file where I actually included those things, even though they matter and they change how the build behaves. So we're getting different and more complete behavior out of this. And so I would say that 162 milliseconds, or even for a big project, the extra six seconds, uh, I think that's worth it. Okay. So moving on to incremental builds. So incremental builds uh, are important, but why do we actually want these? Well, we want to save time. So we're gonna try to evaluate how much time Riker can save when compared to make. Uh, 
The first step in doing that is we have to actually specify a build to Riker. So we'll look at an example. Uh, in this case, it's Redis. So Redis has a, a pretty interesting build. It does something that's common to a lot of projects. Uh, the first thing it does is it generates a header file that describes the commit that we're on. Uh, it uses some git commands and some pipes and text filtering uh, to generate a few, or fill in a few variables in the shell script. And it dumps those out into a header file that's used later in the build. Um, we set a few compiler flags so we don't have to type them in every time. And then we have these three compilation commands. And with some minor omissions to make it fit on the slide, this is the complete build specification for Riker, or for Redis. So what we want to do is understand incremental build performance. So we need to have some changes to the project. Uh, and we decided to use the actual source control repositories for these projects. So what we do is we check out the repository at some older revision. Uh, and then we update the build as we progress over the next 100 commits to that project. So if we didn't have any kind of incremental build system and we just ran full builds all the time, uh, we would have a, a graph that looks like this. That's not very nice. Um, but if you use Redis's make file, you get builds that look like this. We've got some large ones interspersed with a lot of smaller builds. And over this whole time, make is able to save 29 minutes compared to running the full build at every one of those commits. And if we look at Riker's performance using that specification I showed you earlier, we're able to save 26 minutes. So it's not quite as much as make, but remember we're getting a lot more complete checking for all of that. And I think, again, three minutes, not too high a price to pay over 100 commits to get that uh, assured correctness. So we did this for a few other projects where we specified Riker files. Um, and you can see uh, that Riker is often able to match or nearly match makes incremental build performance. SQLite is obviously a strange outlier in this case. That's because it has no incremental builds possible. It just concatenates all the source files together before compiling. Uh, but if we leave that one out of the mix and we look at just the ones where incremental builds are actually possible, make is able to save 4.16 hours over these 500 commits. Uh, and Riker is able to save 3.92 hours of building time over those 500 commits. So that means we're getting 94% of make savings, but there was no manual effort to specify those incremental builds, and there was no risk of errors from missed dependencies. So in conclusion, make forces you to choose between simple build specifications or fast build specifications. And if you choose the fast one, it gets complicated, and those complicated builds are easy to get wrong. The better way to go about things is to use Riker. Uh, so Riker lets you write simple build scripts like this Riker file here. Uh, and for that specification, you still get an automatically fast incremental build that is correct because it has complete dependencies. So I should say that Riker is available. You can go to riker.sh. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>